All right. Good morning, everybody. This is Jeff J. Brown, China Rising Radio, Sino Land in Shenzhen, just south of the Tropic of Cancer. And I am deeply honored and um, happy to have on the air today uh, Dr. Morris Berman. How are you doing, Morris? Very well. Thanks for having me. And uh, Morris, uh, are you? I understand you're in Mexico, or maybe even Mexico City. That's right. That's right. Right mm-hmm. now, I'm a few hours out of Mexico City in a small town, actually. Okay, cool. Wish I wish I wish I could be there to uh, watch a sunset with you. It's getting really hot up there. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'm going to read. Uh, uh, I'm going to read Morris's uh, biography, and then I'm going to get into the uh, first question. Um, uh, he has quite a resume. Uh, Morris Berman is a well known is well known as an innovative cultural historian and social critic. He has taught at a number of universities in Europe and North America, and has held visiting endowed chairs at Incarnate Word College in San Antonio, the University of New Mexico, and Weber State University. During 1982-88, he was the Lansdowne Professor in the History of Science at the University of Victoria, British Columbia. Berman won the Governor's Writers Award for Washington State in 1990, the Rollo May Center Grant for Humanistic Studies in 1992, uh, and the Neil Postman Award, one of my heroes, uh, the Neil Postman Award for Career Achievement and Public Intellectual Activity from the Media Ecology Association in 2013. He is the author of a trilogy on the evolution of human consciousness. They are The Reenchantment of the World, 1981, Coming to Our Senses, 1989, and Wandering God, A Study in Nomadic Spirituality, 2000. And in 2000, his Twilight of American Culture was named, quote, notable book, end of quote, by the New York Times Book Review, Dr. Berman relocated to Mexico in 2006 and during 2008-2009 was a visiting professor at Tecnológico de Monterrey in Mexico City. Wow, what a resume, uh, Morris. Uh, I, I'm impressed. Oh, thank you. <laughs> hey, listen, um, uh, I, the, the, for, for, all of, uh, for all of our fans out there, the, the, the basis of this interview is a book that um, – uh, uh, I just read that uh, uh, Morris uh, uh, wrote recently called Are We There Yet? Uh, and the subtitle is Essays, Re- Essays and Reflections 2010-2017. And I took pages of notes. And, uh, and so uh, here's the first question, and it is based on um, uh, the, uh, this book. Uh, I reached out to you after using your American hustler. I love that. Your American hustler meme in one of my China Trilogy books and in an article or two, and it really resonated with me. You then invited me to read one of your latest books, Are We There Yet?, a compilation of your essays and speeches from 2010 to 2017 uh, to use as, as a springboard for our interview, which I just finished. It was a thoroughly enjoyable and thought-provoking and informative read, and, and, and I'm a seasoned anti-imperialist and do a lot of writing, reading, and research on the subject, and, and I still learn so much. It was really an eye-opener. And uh, in, one of your fir- in, one of your, in one of the early chapters in your book, um, you, talk, you talked about a book that, that – um, uh, Joyce Appleby, Capitalism and a New Social Order that she wrote. And in it, she talked about how by the 1790s, this is going into the United States, American settlers lost their sense of commonwealth and society, became la- laissez faire, in other words, neoliberal. Um, and how did she square this peg in the round hole of these settlers? Um, you know, grotesque genocide of Native Americans, the theft of their lands, and the widespread slavery and indentured service of of uh, people from from Africa. In her uh, an Indigenous Peoples History of the United States, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz said that war was declared against the Indians the day the settlers landed in Virginia on May 14, 1607 to start Jamestown, and the physical and spiritual carnage continues to this day. That, that book was, was an also an eye-opener. So are the genocidal, exploitive roots of America the cause of the settlers' loss of Commonwealth society, or were they, or were they separate from the country's social evolution towards today's um, rape-and-plunder neo, neoliberalism? What do you think? Well, uh, 
um, it's kind of difficult to answer because, in a sense, we're mixing apples and oranges. Um, uh, Joyce Evelby, who is, uh, well, I think she died in 2016, but she was a uh, professor at Harvard for many years in American history and um, wrote some marvelous books, among them the one you mentioned. Uh, but she doesn't discuss the genocide of the Indian, the Native American population. That's not uh, the subject, <laughs> excuse me, of that little book. Um, so uh, there's the issue. I mean, what she's really focusing on is the shift from a definition of virtue, which was classical, uh, dating at least from Aristotle or Cicero, uh, that... Uh, virtue consists of putting uh, the interests of the commonwealth uh, above your own private interests. Uh, a creed almost no American politician subscribes to today. It's always me first. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, that's that's the reality. Regardless of what they say, that's the reality. Yeah. And and um, she dates this to 1790 and Thomas Jefferson's uh, campaign of 1800 and so on. But in fact, when I did the research on this particular topic, I discovered that uh, she was 100 years off. Um, it started uh, uh, in the 1690s, not the 1790s. And uh, there are a number of uh, books on this. The best one was a William Bushman. I can't remember the author, but the title was... Uh, from Puritan to Yankee, uh, <laughs> you know, which this pretty much describes the map, you know. Um, and uh, so it was very quickly that we started off, perhaps, uh, with some in, in the Puritan mind of the Puritan divines as Commonwealth comes first. But very rapidly, it was private interest uh, mm -hmm. comes first. And, <laughs> excuse me, and... Um, the uh, the issue of relating that, I mean, it, it would be a kind of oblique relationship to uh, uh, the massacre of the uh, Native American population. But uh, interestingly enough, uh, the Native American definition of virtue is pretty much the same as the classical Greek or yeah, Roman yeah, definition. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Of yeah. That is, community comes first. Mm -hmm. Your own private interest, that's nice, but that's not number one. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we have is really, uh, from the beginning, I mean, Native Americans are practically invisible as far as the settlers are concerned. They, at most, they were an obstacle to progress, and therefore, and civilization, and I use that word in quotes, and therefore had to be wiped off the map. Um, it's interesting reading... Uh, Native American philosophy from that point of view. Sitting Bull, for example, uh, said of the white man, uh, possessions are a disease with them. And uh, said to, to one white settler, uh, you know, you judge a man by what he owns, and we judge a man by what he gives away. <laughs> That's you brilliant. Know? That's so... These are these are two different yeah. ways of being, yeah. and those are the those are the ones that clashed. Now, since the settlers from 1690 or earlier that came over were not Native Americans, uh, they were entrepreneurial Brits, and uh, it was very easy for them to make the transition from uh, the classical definition of virtue to the selfish definition of virtue, you know, that it was me, myself, and I. Um, the Native Americans never made that transition because that was a violation of their entire way of life. Yeah. And one way of capturing what uh, uh, Roxanne uh, Dunbar-Ortiz, whom you referred to, wonderful, wonderful historian, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Um, but one way of, of framing that whole thing is uh, we had people... Uh, whose entire philosophy of life was grab, smash, and take, and confronting a people whose uh, attitude uh, toward the world was, "How can I help you?" Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I mean, well, one one was easily defeated by the other. Yeah, but yeah. The, the legacy of that is that you know we celebrate Thanksgiving. 
and you have this image of, you know, how they taught us how to grow corn and crap like that. And, you know, I mean, what we're celebrating is one of the largest massacres of indigenous populations in the history of the world. Yeah. That's what's being celebrated. Yeah, you know? exactly. Um, so, <clears throat> and it's also the case that most Americans, and partly it's that Americans really aren't very bright as a whole, but it's also the school system that teaches them that the country was basically empty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, it was, it was know, no man's when, land. Terra nullis. <laughs> yeah, terra sure. nullis. It, was, it was just an empty country, and we came in and filled it up, you know. <laughs> and uh, I don't know uh, what... Uh, Eden. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know what brilliant uh, wag uh, made the statement. Uh, it was something like, as far as... Uh, as far as the settlers uh, coming over, it would have been better instead of landing on Plymouth Rock. That Plymouth Rock would have landed on them. <laughs> That's funny. Oh my gosh. So do, do you? Th I mean, was there a trigger? I mean, do you? Um, it, it, was it was it was it us? You know, you, you, we're picking dates here: 1690 and 1790 by Mrs. Appleby. Are the? I mean, what what happened? I mean, what was? What do you think the trigger was? Was it just sort of? Um, was it? Well, it, it was long in coming because, you know, there's a there's a great book by uh, the American historian Lewis Hartz, "The Liberal Tradition in America." It was 1955. And what Hartz argued was that there's such a thing as a fragment society. And what he meant by that was that when a colony separates off from the mother country, it doesn't take the whole way of life of the mother country. It takes a fragment. And that fragment becomes the whole. So when uh, these settlers came over, uh, you know, there wasn't too much interest in Shakespeare and Dowland and, uh, <laughs> you, know, you know, Elizabethan music. I mean, you know, what they were interested in was getting their cut. Yeah. And that's the fragment that became the whole. And that's why I wrote the book, Why America Failed. Um, you know, I took the idea of the hustler yeah. as the iconic American from a terrific uh, American historian, Walter McDougall. Uh, freedom just around the corner. And when he says even today, when two Americans run into each other, they're strangers and they meet at a party, the immediate thing that's going on in their mind is, how can this person promote my career yeah, or exactly. put money in my yeah, pocket? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah you know, exactly. that's considered the normal interaction in the United States. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, this is the type of thing that made Sitting Bull throw up. <laughs> you, know, uh, yeah. you call that a relationship? You know. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you know, we, we, we. I don't want to go there, but you know, the stuff you're saying about Sitting Bull and the and the Native Americans. I mean, that's just pure, you know, Confucianism and Taoism and uh, and Buddhism. You know, just you know, the, your 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 worth is what you know you give away and what you renounce and and uh, you know sharing and you know the, it's just the whole mentality is just uh, outside outside of the you know what I call your Anglo land. You know the you know North America, Western Europe. Uh, Australia, New Zealand, and we have to throw in Israel, you know, it's just all, you know, it's just, and, and that, in that part of the world, it's just, you know, the, the, the ethic, the ethic has, it may, it may have, it, it may have been like the Native Americans and the, uh, and, and, and Chinese thought, you know, back during the time of Aristotle, but it sure, but it sure changed, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, in the years to come, so, uh, well, let's move on to the next question, and this one's this one's quite long. And I'll tell you, I, I've never, I've, I have never, you know, uh, Morris, you really, you really um, got my my thinking juices <laughs> flowing because I have never come up with questions <laughs> questions like this with any other uh, with any other uh, guests. So uh, I, I want to. Well, let's let's do our audience a favor. Why don't you just summarize it? Well, I. Um, all right. Uh, I love your, this is my next question. I love your American werewolf complex meme. I thought that was brilliant. 
uh, that Yankees have always needed and still must have a savage beast to fear and kill. And uh, in my writings, it's uh, those are who I call the dreaded other. And, uh, I mean, it's just, you know, it's just, uh, you know, Native Americans to Africans, I mean, to Irish and Jews and Muslims now and Latinos and, and, um, and, uh, and so I just wanted to, you know, uh, uh, there was, there was this great book uh, by uh, Robert Williams Jr. called uh, Savage Anxieties, The Invention of Western Civilization. And he talked about how this goes back, you know, the foreign monsters and the beasts go back to prehistoric, you know, prehistoric, you know, Greece, that this is nothing new. And, um, and, and, and because of that, and another book that I read, I kind of came up, you know, with, um, uh, you know, what I call Western civilizations, you know, six E's, you know, expansionism, extermination, expropriation, extraction, enslavement, and ev evangelism. And so, you know, and, and Dunbar Ortiz, she wrote about how the, 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 uh, the Europeans, I'm sorry, the, the British actually got their, their colonial total war, you know, the kill all, burn all, and, and destroy all, actually from the Crusades going back to the Middle Ages when uh, Western Europe, you know, went down to Palestine to, um, to, uh, to, uh, to kill uh, Muslims and, and Slavs uh, to the east. And so, anyway, when I, after reading all that, I kind of had an epiphany, and that is that the prehistoric Greeks got their paranoia and, and pathology and monsters actually going back because actually um, uh, Ortiz was talking about how the Scot the Scots Irish were the fir firm believers in the covenant that they. The the, 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 and, and they were used by the elites uh, for total war on the Indians and, and that they had a religious covenant, you know, that hardcore, you know, kind of um, uh, uh, Protestant, you know, Protestant uh, strain, you know, you know, take no prisoners and very punitive. And so anyway, I had this incredible, uh, over, over, over the Christmas holidays when, when I went back to the States, I had this epiphany after reading that that I had always said it started with with Alexander the Great you know in 300 BC but now I'm, I'm beginning to think that it's the, the West's pathology goes all the way back to the you know the Old Testament you know slash um, you know Torah and and uh, because you know the Old Testament is just you know has has all, all that the Greek mythology has, you know, the incest and the parasite and the matricide and the rape and the genocide and all that. So what I, am I on to something here? I mean, I, you know, do you really, uh, how far back do you think, you know, the West's um, pathology goes? I mean, you, you talked about how Aristotle and uh, other ancient Greeks, you know, had ideal, you know, ideals about, about commonwealth. But what do you think about that? Well, you'll have to, you know, do a little research uh, regarding the dating of all that because, you know, the uh, Old Testament wasn't written in one sitting. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's true. You know, I mean, it, it stretches over many authors and mm -hmm. uh, many years, and it may have uh, come after the Greeks, for all I know. Yeah. Depends on which Greeks we're talking about. But, <laughs> um, you know, it. Uh, I, I, I once did study this, but uh, now it's vague in my mind. It's just that you'll have to check into the exact dating, okay. so that you're not, you know, you're not attributing to, uh, yeah, 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 uh, you know, yeah. Uh, so that's one thing. But the other thing is that um, it depends on, you know, how you want to read the Bible. Um, I uh, always regarded it as a morality tale. So yeah, it's true. Uh, you know, you mentioned all the. Uh, horrible, crummy things that occur, uh, you know, in its pages, but th these were examples of how to screw up your life, <laughs> you know, I mean, quite honestly, you know, you have King David, and he's after, uh, was it Jezebel, the wife yeah, of, yeah. Uh, you know, one of his soldiers, so he posts the soldier to the front line, so he'll get killed, and then he can sleep with Jezebel, and yeah, I mean, what, what the authors were saying is, don't do this, this is bad behavior, do not do this. You know, and so that's how I read the the Old Testament as a morality tale, uh, not as some sort of vicious document. And um, interestingly enough, I think it's first century A.D. Rabbi Hillel, who's one of the great 
Jewish thinkers of all time, was asked by a Roman centurion, uh, I don't have time to read the Bible. Can you tell me uh, what's in it? <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> and the, uh, I don't know if he used Hebrew or Aramaic in that discussion, but the Hebrew phrase is al regal echad, on, on one foot. Can you tell me what's in the Bible in the time it would take me to balance on one foot? In other words, about 30 seconds. And Hillel said, yes, I can. What's hateful to you, don't do to other people. Yeah. That's the essence of the Old Testament. He said, everything else is just editorializing. Yeah. I thought it was a great line. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. All right. Well, that's you know. I just um, I, I I read. Uh, there's another book I read. I can't I can't think of. He's a Swedish guy, and and he was bumming around, uh, traveling around North Africa, and and uh, he wrote about. He went to all these places in North Africa where the the French, uh, basically the French, had committed all these horrific uh, genocides, <laughs> and and anyway, I just kind of put it all together, and then when and and when she talked about the covenant, I just it just clicked in my mind, and um, and uh, I can I can recommend her book, and I can, well I can recommend uh, also uh, Robert Williams. Um, you know that savage anxiety is, is is a great book too. So, but I appreciate that perspective. I um, I uh, um, uh, uh, hadn't thought about that, but I uh, that's uh, that's that, that's good counsel. Uh, in your essays, you seem to be hard on socialism, as and since I'm in a socialist country, <laughs> in your essays, you know you're really you seem to be pretty hard on socialism as you are on capitalism. And if I understand you right, you stated that they both have the same consumerist American dream aspirations. And uh, but my journalist friend Raman Mazahari says that if you're a socialist anti-imperial country, then the the capitalist global elites put a bullseye on your back and will spend billions of dollars in euros and massacre millions of your people to destroy your way of life. And I mean that's been true since Marx, you know, wrote the Com Communist Manifesto and 19th century. Populist movements in the U.S. and the Paris Commune were crushed and or sabotaged, you know, by what I like to call our owners. And, you know, I mean, I, 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 when I read that the capitalist West and Imperial Japan sent 200,000 soldiers to try to destroy the nascent 1917 Communist Russian Revolution, I, I mean, I had, you know, that, that was an eye opener for me. I mean, it has just been nonstop, you know, anti-socialist, you know, terror and genocide and government overthrows, which you actually talk about several of them ever since, including Europe um, with its secret uh, CIA, you know, MI6 Gladio armies. And just look at, you know, China and, and, and Russia and Iran and North Korea, Venezuela, Cuba, Syria, Libya. I mean, the list is long, you know, really, really long. And... Um, uh, I, I I loved reading uh, about um, um, Franklin Roosevelt's vice president Henry Wallace, who was who was basically a socialist, declared that he wanted the U.S. to compete head to head against the Soviet Union uh, without all the subterfuge and government overthrows, etc. And uh, you know he was uh, deposed, and and Harry Truman took his place, and. Anyway, that being the case, I mean, you know, and last night they, they, they sabotaged the electricity in Venezuela and turned off the electricity in Venezuela. You know, that being the case, how can it be said that socialism is a failure since it's never been allowed to develop without its, you know, metaphorical, you know, feet shackled in one arm tied behind its back? I mean, you know, Cuba has calculated that the U.S. blockade has cost that small country you know, over a trillion dollars uh, since 1959, and you know, with blockades and sanctions and expropriation. You know, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's hypothetical because, as you say, all this opposition uh, existed from the first. I mean, President Wilson sent 10,000 troops into uh, Russia to uh, oppose the, uh, yeah, the yeah. revolution in 1917. You know, so, I mean, you're right, there's been this uh, endless, endless uh, attack. Uh, and so it's possible, we'll never know, really, it's possible that, uh, <coughs> excuse me, that these systems would have been more successful uh, if they'd been left alone. Um, but, I don't know, my own point about socialism uh, is that 
it's not a substantially different vision from capitalism, mm. except for the idea or ideal of a better distribution of wealth. Yeah. That, that's the, the crucial point as to how things are going to be distributed. And um, the fact is that, uh, so that capitalism focuses on the accumulation of wealth, and socialism so, so supposedly focuses on the distribution, and the one analysis of the failure of the Soviet Union was that it did not focus, it focused so little on accumulation that finally it just went broke. <laughs> uh, you know, the economy couldn't, couldn't sustain itself yeah. on that basis. But even then, I'm skeptical because I'm not sure that, for example, the Soviet Union or even Cuba today, um, are doing so well uh, along the lines of uh, of distribution, uh, a very popular um, joke in the Soviet Union, I think around the 1980s, I can't remember, but it was a very popular joke. Of course, you couldn't say it out loud. You'd wind up in Siberia for 10 years, but um, passed around was something like um, a guy goes into a butcher shop in Moscow, and he notices that the shelves are empty. Uh, and he says to the butcher, don't you have any meat? And the butcher says, oh, no, you're confused. This is the shop that doesn't have any fish. The <laughs> shop that doesn't have any meat is across the street. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, it's true. In terms of the delivery of consumer goods, it was appalling, you know. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you, what you had uh, in the United States was a superfluity that was ridiculous why do we need 47 varieties of, of razor blades, you know? <laughs> Why do we need Cocoa Puffs and Cocoa Puffs Supreme? And, you know, I mean, I mean you just look at it, it's absurd. Uh, who would need all this crap, you know? But uh, the Soviet Union was at the other end of the uh, spectrum, and um, not too many people were happy about that, especially if you lived in the Soviet Union. But the similarity is that both systems are premised on economic and technological expansion, and if possible, industrialization. Neither system, uh, socialism or capital, is very concerned with the environment, with human psychology, uh, with neither of them have a spiritual, genuine spiritual dimension. They're both purely materialistic. Neither, <coughs> excuse me, neither addresses the problems of um, corruption and the lust for power. Uh, you know that famous line from Kant, uh, how's it go? Uh, from the crooked timber of humanity, nothing straight was ever made. <laughs> you know, and, and this is true, and you, you, you have to uh, account for it. One of my favorite shows of all time, you probably are, have seen it yourself, uh, was this series called The Americans with uh, Kerry Russell and Matthew Reese. It just uh, ended its sixth season, and it's over now. I love that show. Uh, I mean, I would like to see one that indicts uh, American, the CIA, to the same extent <laughs> that, uh, you know, that the KGB was indicted. Uh, but then, you know, because this is America, we wouldn't have many viewers, you know. People wouldn't be interested in that. Um, so, but it, I mean, it, it shows the uh, tremendous level of corruption that existed in the Soviet Union so that people uh, couldn't get anywhere. They couldn't, you know, and... and Gorbachev was obviously a, a welcome, uh, a fresh breeze in the whole thing. Um, the Personally, I think that the redistribution of wealth obviously would be a very good thing. Last time I checked into the figures in the United States, something like the four richest people or five richest yeah, people have more than owned as much half. as the bottom 50%. Yeah, yeah. Of the entire, I mean, that's obscene. You know, yeah. it's it's actually surreal when it's you think about it. Criminal. How did we ever wind up in a situation like this, you know? Yeah. And so obviously, uh, distribu redistribution of wealth is something worth fighting for. And I'm not, uh, in that sense, I am a socialist and I'm not opposed to that at all. But uh, the question is finally, if you ever get there, uh, what's your life going to consist of? Mm -hmm. Okay, now you've got now you've got a uh, 
what was Hoover's line? Uh, two cars in every garage and a chicken in every pot. You know. So <laughs> once you have that, then what? You know. <laughs> then what? Then you need. Then you need another house. You know. It's, it ne- it never ends with capitalism. You know. But it never ends with socialism either. And and that's the point. These systems are very very different from what you were talking about earlier with virtue and Lao Tzu and so on. There's a line in. Uh, in the Tao Te Ching, I think it is the, uh, the one who realizes that enough is enough is the one who has enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, exactly. I mean, we don't have neither system has the notion of an upper limit. You know, and, uh, and this becomes problematic. I think. Very interesting. All right, next question. Really enjoying this, and I know our fans are too. I carry two passports, French and American, and agree with you that Europeans are are different to Americans. They are more clued in about world events, history, and classical culture. You wrote that we can't just blame governments for their illegal or reprehensible actions. The citizens must also accept responsibility for voting them into power. Then how do you explain Europe's odious foreign policy? It, it bends over and drops its trousers for Uncle Sam every time, even at the expense of its own people. And we can look at the destruction of Serbia, the genocide in Libya, which the British and the French did for the Americans, the pillage of Ukraine and the downing of flight MH17 and anti-Russian hysteria. And uh, just now, uh, you know, the, the Europe is siding with the U.S. to support the non-elected imperial puppet as so-called president in Venezuela. It really infuriates me. I mean, I really, I just, it just actually makes my blood pressure go up. Because after giving up on the Uni- United States, I held out, hoped that Europe would be the great Western savior for humankind. But then U- Ukraine came along in 2014, and I gave up on the old continent, too. Why is this so? Why can't Europe be Europe? I mean, are they trying to live their glorious old days of an imperial rape and plunder? What do you think is going on? Well, uh, one thing that's going on is that in the post-war period, uh, Europe got uh, heavily Americanized. Yeah. Um, there's a... I don't know if she's still at Columbia. Victoria de Grazia was a professor at Columbia, and she wrote a book. Um, oh God, it slips my mind. Uh, but our listeners can find it by just plugging uh, Victoria de Grazia into Google or Amazon. Mm-hmm. It was something like um, Imperial Destiny or something like this. But it basically talked about the consumer takeover of Europe by the United States. Uh, it predated our... Uh, phrase soft power, but that's really what it was. Uh, it was um, victory uh, over um, any alternative form to capitalism by means of soft power. And um, the other thing is that looms perhaps even larger is that siding with the United States after 1945 was really inevitable because Europe saw the United States, rightly or wrongly, it saw the United States as its only protection against the Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. And so the world was divided in the Manichaean scheme, you know, uh, black versus white, and the United States was seen as the guarantor of stability. And so that was the, the alignment, uh, even though, you know, when we opened the KGB archives after... Um, the fall of the Soviet Union. For a few years, they were open to American historians, and we discovered that uh, actually the uh, Soviet Union's greatest fear was not the United States, it was Germany. Uh, they were afraid that Germany would reunite after the war and po- continue to pose a threat. And um, that uh, the, uh, uh, the um, colonization of satellite states, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and so on, uh, was was pretty shabby, obviously, on the part of the Soviet Union, and yet it was seen as protecting its borders. Um, and so it wasn't all evil. It was it was all also seen as defensive from the Soviet point of view. Mm-hmm. So we've learned a lot more about what the Soviet Union was actually up to. But at that time, at that time in the post-war period, 
um, the splitting of Berlin, the you know the four sectors. Uh, you are now leaving the American sector, or whatever it was at Checkpoint Charlie. Um, that whole scheme was seen by Europe as absolutely necessary uh, to protect Europe from the encroachment of the big bear. You know, so and then on top of that, you had the influx of a whole lot of dollars into Europe for the reconstruction of Europe, which the Europeans, uh, you know, obviously appreciated, even though. The uh, the real agenda of the Marshall Plan and all that stuff was to see to it that capitalism was triumphant. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That was really the real goal. You know? Yeah. The only thing I I need to add is a P.S. here, uh, which always strikes me as very interesting, is given the European attitude toward U.S. good, Soviet Union bad, is that by some twist of fate or perception. Post-war America was identified with the defeat of the Nazis. And the truth was, it was actually the Red Army that did the heavy lifting. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think most military historians agree on this point. Russia lost 32 million people Mm -hmm. in the effort to defeat Germany. America lost a few hundred thousand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, So, you know, I mean, who is it that actually defeated the Nazis? And yet, in the European mind, um, <coughs> excuse me, it was the Soviet Union that emerged as this enemy, and an awful lot of that was, um, you know, the whole aggressive stance that Truman and Churchill took toward the Soviet Union, the Iron Curtain, and um, the the great, you know, just the great the evil empire in, yeah. in Reagan terms, you know. <clears throat> well, you know, Europe somehow bought that. You know, not that it was a good empire. You know, I wouldn't want to spend too much time in a gulag. But at the same time, uh, it was more complicated than black and white. And, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, but I suppose it's easy for, in hindsight, to see that. Yeah, yeah. Well, and also at the same time, you know, using, um, uh, you know, you know, quasi-governmental organizations like the Atlantic Bridge and all these, um, you know, bilateral, um, you know, organizations and the Council of Foreign Affairs and all that. Uh, you know, they, the, you know, the the United States did a brilliant job of, you know, uh, uh, cult- cultivating uh, pro-American uh, politicians and pro-American, you know. Bureaucrats, and now they're just—they're just—they just—they've infected the entire, you know, Brussels and and uh, the the national capitals in um, in Europe are just full of uh, people who have been, you know, uh, you know, sort of, you know, taught the American way. And so I don't know how I don't know how it's going to end up, but uh, <laughs> every time they like when the, last week, you know, the uh, Gua- Guaido, the the the. the, the the the, the 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 puppet the puppet the, uh, Bolton and and um, and uh, Trump's uh, you know puppet president uh, in Venezuela you know comes back from Colombia and he's surrounded by did you read that he was surrounded by the German French and British and one other European ambassador they uh, literally they, they they came to the airport to to, to create a cordon around him uh, so that uh, he uh, wouldn't be arrested, and I'm sitting, I'm going, you know, Europe, you know, what are you doing? And then, and then, and then they're saying, but you know, but we can't, ha- but we can't have an invasion, you know, in, in Venezuela. But they practically asked for it by, you know, toadying up to the United States. So, anyway, the 21st century is going to be very interesting indeed. <laughs> All right, next question. We both agree that the United States is heading for a crash, and it will probably bring down its client states, too, including what I call Uranglo land and um, Israel. The specter of a final paroxysm of world war and or nuclear winter to save, it, to save it is no laughing matter and could mean the end of our species. However, you wrote about some very hopeful developments in Europe uh, and using Japan's socioeconomic uh, Tokugawa, the the Edo period uh, before the uh, Meiji, um, before the Meiji restoration. restoration, yeah, which was 250 years of peace and sustainable growth under the shogunate, in what some Westerners would call a military dictatorship. And and meanwhile, you know, China is taking its own path of 
ancient Chinese thought, and you know they're combining Marxism and Leninism and Maoist, uh, Shiist uh, dictatorship of the people with plans to create an advanced, powerful, and rich com communist society this century. Russia is doing its anti-imperial Slavic thing, and Iran is developing its Islamic socialist model. Please tell us what is going on in Europe that you find so encouraging, uh, along with historical Japan, as possible models for a post-American dream, uh, post dream and then world, if we survive as a species, and, and feel free to comment on China, Russia, and Iran as well. Well, that should take about six hours. Uh, <laughs> we don't have that long, Morris. I don't think so. Um, but, uh, you know, the truth is I don't have that much to say about alternative experiments uh, beyond what I wrote. Uh, first, in my book on Japan, um, the, uh, the title of it is uh, Neurotic Beauty. And the last chapter deals with uh, socioeconomic experiments of an alternative nature uh, in Japan, involving especially alternative currencies and also yeah, alternative uh, energy that, sources. Yeah. Okay. Um, there has been uh, a lot of talk uh, in Japan about what they call the Satori generation, uh, young people who don't want to work for Mitsubishi or Toyota and give their lives to a large corporate entity <laughs> that has no soul and basically, you know, they'll just wind up Hiring hookers and getting cancer and a wonderful you know, life. Drinking, that, drinking uh, just, themselves to death. Yeah, for some reason doesn't attract the younger generation all that much. But um, the the fact is that I mean, when I was in Japan and I interviewed people and I investigated this, that path is a small path. It's not. It's like, <laughs> excuse me. It's like the Green Party in the United States. Yeah, We're talking yeah, about one, two yeah. percent of the population. Yeah. And uh, the fact that, um, you know, that Shinzo Abe, who is a jackass of the first yeah, order, yeah. I mean, you know, a bigger jackass, only Trump probably is a bigger jackass <laughs> than uh, Shinzo Abe on the American, on the national, international political scene. But, um, you know, the fact that he was reelected and the fact that uh, Japanese, when polled, uh, are not actually uh, opposed to uh, uh, nuclear energy. Um, After was, Fukushima. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was in 2012. I was invited to give some lectures at the University of Tokyo, and I suppose as a foreigner, it was kind of rude for me to say this, but I said, um, how many Fukushimas is it going to take for you folks to decide that nuclear power plants are not a good idea? Yeah. You, you need to have an, another one, you know. Do you need to have five more? When do you, you know, the the uh, radioactivity is p picked up in streams in Massachusetts, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. from Fukushima. I mean, w at what point do you say, gee, this isn't a good idea, and maybe Shinzo Abe is not the best person to be prime minister? You know, <laughs> what point, you know? So, so this alternative is small, but the argument that I make in uh, that chapter, and also the last essay. In the book you mentioned, Are We There Yet?, it's called Dual Process, mm -hmm. uh, by which I mean that as capitalism falls apart, which we are witnessing right now, that's the story of the 21st century, uh, that as capitalism simply falls apart, um, we have to develop alternative institutions and ways of life to step in and replace mm -hmm. the ones that have fallen apart. And so we are talking about uh, alternative uh, currencies and alternative energy sources and just alternative ways of life. Uh, the separatist movement in Scotland or Catalonia. I mean, I predicted the Balkanization of Europe in a book I wrote in 1981 called The Reenchantment of the World. And, you know, it essentially says that uh, the best vision is a decentralized one. It's small scale. Uh, it's not, uh, you know, huge empires that... Uh, basically trample mm -hmm. over everybody. But uh, the possibility of um, that happening, uh, I can only say that there's been the greatest activity of um, alternative uh, modes in countries that have experienced uh, severe austerity. Uh, Greece, mm -hmm. Portugal, Spain. Spain, yeah, Spain, yeah. You know, 
these are the countries that are really, uh, you know, uh, for example, experimenting with barter systems uh, instead of cash payment. Um, all kinds of things like this uh, because they're simply forced into it. Uh, it's, it, you know, it's, it's an alternative or die, you know. And so <laughs> this, this is what I think uh, might be coming down the pike, that the choice will be uh, between sustainable society or no society at all. Yeah. You know, and I think that's what we're going to face. The, the, um, you also mentioned, and I've read articles about how, uh, especially in Spain, and you even cited some numbers about, you know, uh, employee, you know, owned businesses and cooperatives. And, um, I read an article a few years ago, uh, about how some people, a, a, a plant was closed down. I think it was in, uh, in, um, Barcelona, Catalan, and, and, um, you know, some faceless, you know, you know, uh, 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 headquarters in, you know, Brussels or Berlin or someplace, you know, close this place down. And the the citizens of that town, you know, after it had been closed down for a year and a half or two years, they just went in and basically, you know, took it over, you know, busted the door down and, and restarted the plant. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, basically just took it over. So yeah, I think uh, I think um, I think you're onto something there, and um, and uh, you know, the, the something has to happen for a sustainable uh, future because we cannot keep uh, the the capitalist you know mantra of you know continuous expansion, continuous uh, consumption. Not in a finite world. Yeah, yeah, not in a finite world. And um, anyway, very thought provoking. You, I love your writings about. Um, about um, Mexico. Um, in fact, my wife, my wife wants to move there next year after we retire. And uh, you write very fondly of the Amer of the Mexican people and their and their sense of community, and especially at the neighborhood and family level. And please compare and contrast their social hierarchy with that of the United States, where, as you wrote, the me myself and I Marlboro man. <laughs> reigns supreme and why you like it so much you know western headlines splash horror stories of you know tens of thousands of murders every year and give the impression that mexico is a, like a failed narco state uh, you know sending millions of its riffraff uh, north of the rio grande tell us about uh, uh, tell us about the mexican people and why you like it so much yeah yeah um well, you know, I'm happy about those headlines because they scare off the gringos. <laughs> Who needs more gringos down here? You know, we need them like a hole in the head. Uh, but, um, you know, I mean, there are all sorts of th statistics I could pull out. But the things that have made an impression on me are small events. And usually, usually something like this will happen two or three times a month and I'm suddenly aware that I'm not living in the United States. Um, I uh, rent an apartment in Mexico City. It's one flight, flight up. Uh, there's no elevator. And about a year ago, I was coming back from the supermarket and I had a bunch of groceries in plastic bags. And one of the bags broke halfway up the stairs. And so oranges and cans of soda and stuff are spilling out <laughs> onto the stairs. And at the top of the stairs, there are uh, two apartments. Um, and uh, the one on the right, uh, the door opens, and a five-year-old girl peers out. Mm -hmm. And she sees what's going on. She doesn't say a word. She comes down the stairs and helps me put all the objects that spilled out of the plastic bags, back into the bags. Not a word is exchanged. She Once it's done, she climbs back up the stairs, goes back into her apartment, and closes the door. Now, the chances of something like that happening <laughs> in the United States are roughly negative infinity. <laughs> For one thing, girls and women in the United States are taught that men are dangerous. Yeah. You know, and that you have to keep your distance. And, you know, frankly, maybe that's right. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know. But that's what they're taught, that men are scary. 
This girl exhibited none of that, yeah, not yeah. not even the slightest vibration. Yeah. Secondly, uh, uh, people of all genders, uh, colors, religions, and so on, are told that you're on your own. Uh, something happens to somebody else, it's not your problem. It's their problem, just leave them to it. Yeah, yeah. You are not your brother's keeper, and you are not obligated to help anybody, yeah. you know? The uh, finale, the last, uh, the, the very finest, the, follow of, the very last show of uh, Seinfeld, uh, he had a scene where, uh, you know, they, they were arrested for not helping somebody, so-called Good Samaritan law that doesn't exist. Yeah. And uh, Jackie Childs, uh, who was a Johnny Cochran lookalike, you know, uh, says uh, to Jerry on the phone, uh, you're arrested for not helping somebody? Not helping people is what this country's all about. <laughs> and I thought he got that right. <laughs> that's, that's of course Larry David writing that, you know. <laughs> but he's right. That's right. You know, me, myself, and I. That's that's what the country's about. Mexico's not about that. Yeah. That's not how it behaves on a daily basis. Yeah. Uh, the other apartment next to the, where this little girl was. <clears throat> this happened only a couple weeks ago. <clears throat> Uh, is a young couple, about 25 years of age, they're subletting for about six months. I don't really know them. I mean, I know from the preview, from the owner of the apartment, that she went off to stay with her boyfriend in Canada, and so she sublet the apartment to these two and so on. Anyway, I was coming down the stairs this time, uh, because we have daily garbage collection. Truck comes by every day, and you gather up all your stuff, and you go walk down the stairs, and you give it to the garbage guys. And I was coming down the stairs, and the young guy of the couple, uh, who doesn't know me, says, here, let me take that for you. Yeah. He grabs all the stuff, plastic bottles, uh, you know, bags of garbage and stuff. He says, I'll do that. Yeah. You know, and, and I said, uh, muy amable, you know. And he goes, he didn't have to do that, and in the United States that would never happen. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. and something like this occurs you know, roughly once every one or, or two weeks, and then suddenly I'm aware. Yeah. I'm just aware that I'm not living in the United States. I'm living with people who have a very different value system, mm -hmm. a lot closer to sitting bull yeah. than to, you know, than to, uh, I don't know, President Truman or whatever. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, and, and so it's that kind of thing. There's a cafe I like uh, in this town that I sometimes go and I sit and read or write. There's a group of American women, gringas, that will come in and play mahjong. Mm. And yeah. when they when they blow into the cafe, yeah. when they blow into the cafe, they are so loud that they yeah. are actually screaming. They are, uh, no, no exaggeration. They're actually screaming. Now, I know one of these women. I actually know one of them. And I can say on a personal basis, she's a very kind person. Why then would she do that? This is how Americans operate. You blow into a cafe, you take it over, you're screaming, never mind that other people don't want you there. <laughs> never mind that other, other people are just sitting and reading. No, no, this is our cafe. We'll take it over, we'll play mahjong, and we'll scream our way through. You know, And it, first of all, it reminds me, this is exactly what we did in Iraq. Just this is the microcosm of what we did in Iraq. It's our country. We'll just take it over. And And the other thing is that uh, Walter Lippmann, you know, many decades ago, made this wonderful comment. He said, our imperialism is largely unconscious. And well, that's, that's a true. Good one. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. That's, we don't even know what we're doing. <laughs> you know, if I sat down with this woman and I said, don't you realize that there are other people in the cafe? I mean, did that ever cross your mind? <laughs> she would be shocked. Yeah. Because it didn't cross her mind. Yeah. You know, this is the difference between Americans and, frankly, everybody else on the globe. <laughs> well, it sounds like uh, the Mexican, uh, well, or less, probably Latino, Latino, and I'm sure it has a lot to do with the Native Americans who survived the genocide and the... Mestizos and, and you know is is much more much more like you know Chinese you know Confucianism Taoism Buddhism and and um, 
so the stuff that the kind of things that you're talking about that happened to you, you know, uh, on a, on a daily basis in, in Mexico, or this happened to me here every day, and and um, and uh, so uh, anyway, after our after our interview, and maybe in a few months, I'll contact you about uh, Mexico. Uh, Hope you don't mind maybe two more gringos <laughs> moving to the country because that's what my wife would like to do. But uh, we haven't made a decision yet. So, uh, well, listen, let's close out. This has been a terrific interview, um, uh, Morris. What are your current projects to expose the American dream and bring down its capitalist empire? What are you working on? Well, the last book I wrote... Um Actually, uh, it should be out in two or three months. Oh, really? Um, okay, good. What's it called? Yeah, it's called Genio, which is the Italian word for genius, and it's basically about the genius of Italian creativity. Okay. So it's a book on um, on Italian culture, and it's physically a very beautiful book. It has 21 illustrations. And uh, I'm very, very, uh, I call it my happy book because it was such a pleasure <laughs> to write about this vibrant, intelligent culture uh, as opposed to writing any more about the United States, which yeah. frankly at this point I find kind of boring, you know. Yeah. I mean, the United States is not interesting. The people aren't interesting. The culture isn't interesting. It's one-dimensional. It's just hustling. What's to, what's to be excited about, you know? <laughs> so uh, I'm not doing too much in the way of, more books on America. It was uh, much more fun to write about a real culture, you know, <laughs> and, and uh, that feels really good. Uh, the full title is Genio, uh, The Sources of Italian Genius, and um, it's got chapters on Machiavelli and uh, Bernini and Caravaggio and uh, St. Francis of Assisi, and I think most people are going to love it. It's okay, really, uh, cool. I mean, it could, it could even work as a coffee table book because it's so gorgeous, you know. Okay, cool. And um, as far as talking about, <coughs> excuse me, as far as talking about the collapse of the American Empire, however, um, oh, we still do that. I, I run a blog, and I have done for which um, I'll po I'll post all of your um, your blo uh, the your Morris Berman blog, and I'll post your your mm -hmm. e email so people can contact you, and I'll also post uh, a a link uh, to uh, to where people can find your books. Right, thank you. And um, that blog has been running for 13 years now. April will be 13 years. It's been running, oh, wow. and and uh, we have a good time on it. It's um, a discussion of the collapse of the American Empire, but also humor is a very big part of it. And uh, so uh, you know we have a very good time on the blog. And in terms of documenting the disintegration of the United States. Uh, we have uh, uh, all of 167 registered people on the blog. This is in a nation of 327 million. <laughs> so I have a feeling that, you know, the, the FBI doesn't have too much to worry about me as a threat, <laughs> I would say offhand. But um, we have a lot of fun on the blog, you know. Uh, of course, a lot of Americans are stupid. and. Um, I think that, you know, there are a lot of people that are reading it. Oh, he advocates New King Toronto and Paris. Oh, my God. You know, so uh, just just uh, there's a lot of wry humor on it. And uh, but uh, anyway, also serious uh, contributions. Uh, it's got some very intelligent people that post on it and uh, uh, provide evidence for, uh, you know, things like opioid use and alcoholism and a cell phone addiction and so on and so forth. It basically is destroying the fabric of the country. Okay, cool. Well, listen, Morris, this has been a terrific interview. I loved having you on, and I and um, I know um, our fans out there are really going to enjoy it. I'll get this posted, and I'll send you the um, uh, link, and uh, we can cross link uh, on your blog uh, on your blog page and uh, on China Rising Radio Sino Land and. Thank you so much for um, for uh, coming on the show, and uh, let's stay in touch. Jeff, I really appreciate the invitation. This was this was a load of fun. Okay, well, listen, take care, and uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye now. Bye bye.